Hello, and welcome to RRI Explained, a RESPIOS podcast. It is the aim of the RESPIOS project to embed Responsible Research and Innovation, or RRI, into four universities across Europe in the hope of improving the interconnectivity between science research and society, with a particular focus on the biosciences. But what is RRI exactly? Well, hopefully we can find out together. Today we are joined by Professor Ibo van der Bol, who works in Ethics and Technology at the School of Technology, Policy and Management at Delft University of Technology. Today we are going to be discussing the work that he has done with the PRISMA project, integrating RRI into industry, and the six lessons of doing responsible innovation in industry. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Ivo. If I could just ask you to give a quick introduction to your role at Delft University and the work that you previously done with Pr- the Prisma project, but also working with RRI and industry. Uh, I'm working broadly in the area of, I usually call it ethics of technology, but I'm particularly interested in, in ethical approaches that try to address ethical issues in technology uh, from, from the early start of technological development. So we often call this proactively uh, in the in the early stages of technological development. And, and this is one of my interests, one of the reasons for my interest in responsible innovation, because I think that's very much about addressing ethical and social issues early on in the in the R&D uh, development process of new technologies. I also do quite a bit of work on what we here call uh, design for values. That's more a design approach, but this is built on, this, on the kind of very similar idea Namely, that, that these ethical issues should not come after the fact, after the technologies have entered society, but already early on in the, in the development process. So you've touched upon this a little bit just in your introduction, but could you talk to us a little bit more about why it's important for industries to look at RRI approaches? Obviously, it's become quite a hot topic within research institutes and EU projects have been yeah. quite focused on RRI. But yeah, it's a, probably a very different approach for industries. Obviously, they do have their own projects, but they're also quite well well established. So trying to integrate these changes could be a bit of a challenge, I suppose. I'm just wondering what your approaches are to that and the importance of introducing RRI and ethical considerations for industry. Yeah, I suppose. yeah, yeah. So, so, so let me say a few things about why I think it is important and, and, and maybe even adventurous for, for companies to do so. And I can also say something about some of you already referring to that some of the barriers that might be or might make it more difficult to do with these companies. So uh, I think why this is this is interesting and, and, and even adventurous, maybe in the long run, even also financially adventurous for companies, is that I think in general, uh, certainly with some technologies, uh, companies are facing public resistance to certain te- technologies. People don't accept certain technologies. They are questions. They can be critical about technologies. And I think the ROI approach is about addressing the, these issues early on and to make sure that, that you actually try to develop products that meet the, the values in society, but, but also the values of relevant stakeholders. So I think in general, it means that it makes the chances more likely that products get accepted by users, uh, by people who buy it, but also by other stakeholders. And, and I think if you think of this in terms of, of the de- development cycle of, of products, what it typically so you might say in, in more traditional non-responsible innovation approaches, uh, you might put something onto the market and, and then you might find out that people don't like it or people protest against it. And the cost of adjusting, the innovation might just fail or uh, it might still succeed, but you might make a, a large cost to adjust it. And the idea about responsible innovation is also that by addressing these issues very early on, uh, the overall cost of innovation go down. In addition to this, I think there, is a, there might be also a kind of competitive advantage for companies for doing responsible innovation. And that's the idea that if you can show that you do more responsible innovation than your competitors, uh, some consumers might like that. And, and so it might, might be part of uh, how you distinguish what you do as a company from what other companies uh, do. So I think there might also be something like a competitive uh, advantage. 
Then in terms of barriers or why this might be, be hard, I, I think there are a few. So one is that companies, and this is also what we noticed in this Prisma project, what we did, most companies had never heard about responsible innovation, to be, to, to be honest. So what I usually did is explain them well. Most of them had heard of corporate social re- responsibility, CSR. So I was telling them, well, responsible innovation is basically CSR, but then applied to the innovation uh, process. And I think they could understand that. So I think that was a barrier. Sometimes a barrier might be that they think it might be very costly. So it costs just financial costs. But I think another barrier, and this relates a bit also to the competitive advantage, what I was mentioning, but in a more negative sense, that for many companies, certainly in certain sectors, innovation is the main way in which they gain competitive advantage vis-a-vis other companies. Uh, but that often goes with the view that they should keep their innovations or at least the technical details of the innovation secret to their competitors. So there is a certain reluctance in opening up the innovation process to, to, to outsiders because they feel it is very sensitive to do that and, and, and it might actually... Uh, make or the spy on what you're doing. I don't think this is happening at all in responsible innovation, but this kind of attitude really sometimes make it difficult to convince companies. So they're not used to opening up innovation to outsiders. Uh, th- that's also what we've uh, noted. It feels like it's quite a tight line to walk working yeah. with these companies, just because obviously in the new climate that we find ourselves in, corporate transparency is ever more important for public discourse. Yeah. But of course, you talk about like not corporate secrets, that's maybe a little bit too uh, conspiracy yeah. theory like, but yeah. intellectual property rights of yeah. these yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, innovations. Yeah. So, so one issue is, is patents, intellectual property rights, but there is also a lot of tested knowledge in, in innovation. Actually, I think there is no reason really, I mean, because in responsible innovation, we're not interested necessarily in all the technical knowledge or the technical details, but I think it, is, it has been become a little bit a habit to, to do this with a limited circle of people innovation uh, for some of these reasons, also because it's so key to a company. So I think it is partly that companies just need to see that that there is actually not a big... Uh, so I think it can be overcome. There is not really a, a fundamental barrier here, but it is something companies also need to get a bit more used to, to open up. Uh, sometimes might also because, I mean you still have this idea that technology is something value-free. So, I mean, yeah, if we just innovate and we make the technical choices and, and the societal choices only come when, we, when it comes into society. I mean, and of course, our conviction is that technology itself um, matters in a moral sense. But that's also something that might be unf- unfamiliar to, to companies, these kinds of thoughts. I suppose it must seem like a bit of a catch-22 with some of these companies. People, companies yeah. don't want to get involved with it until... A, it's been kind of proven to be a financially kind of viable option, but B, until other companies decide that, uh, yeah. until other companies get on board, they see the innovation, but they also kind of embrace kind of the open access and public engagement side of that, I suppose. Yeah, and I think I think the interesting thing about the Prisma project we did, uh, so one of the ideas for us for doing the project was actually, so we did eight pilots with different companies, uh, and the idea was actually to showcase that by, by these companies that companies could do this and, and that there were some example companies actually doing this and making this move, so to say. So one of our ideas was, well, of course, to learn by, by, by trying it out, uh, but also to have these as a kind of example to other companies to see, well, you can actually do some things and it might not be that complicated uh, or, or, or that scary <laughs> to do these things. <laughs> well, that follows up quite li- nicely to my next question is, how did you decide which businesses, companies to reach out to as part yeah. of the Prisma project? And yeah, what, what was what was that process like? Yeah, yeah. So the way we selected them, so we, uh, I think a number of criteria played a role. We wanted to have different uh, technologies. So we had some more in the nanotechnology field, some more in the biotech, some more in autonomous systems, uh, digital technologies. We also had some uh, spread over countries. We had some from the UK, we had some from Italy, we had some from the, from the Netherlands. So these were, of, of course, typical in, in scientific projects. <laughs> you want to have this kind of diversity. But to be honest, in, in, in really getting the companies, in, a, a lot turned out to depend on, on just also kind of personal relations we had or we developed with these, these companies. And interestingly, uh, you might think these companies mainly participate because they uh, think they have something to, to earn with it. But I think, interestingly, 
in many cases, it, it was just also individuals in these companies who just want to do good. Uh, like <laughs> I think many people just want to be responsible persons, and then they just they like that idea. So I think a lot of it dependent on on the kind of personal relations we built up as people in these in these companies. That also sometimes makes us a bit vulnerable. So for example, we had one company in which we had a very enthusiastic uh, person uh, wanting to do this. But then this company was taken over by another company and the new company simply found, yeah, didn't like the project. So <laughs> then we had to look for a new pilot. Uh, so we also had that kind of dynamic going on. Right. So it, it seems at least initially it was a, a lot of people that were quite enthusiastic about yeah, yeah. the RRI process, research and innovation, yeah, kind of yeah, pro- yeah, responsible yeah. innovation process. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask if there was any kind of differences between the different industries or even potentially to different countries on the way they approached the project. Yeah, yeah. I think the, I think it's, we had, of course, very small samples. So in, in, it's very hard to generalize in a scientific sound uh, way from that. But I think there were some things we noted. So one interesting thing that we noted is some sectors, particularly more in the biotechnology sectors, uh, one company was working on a technology that met a lot of resistance and and, and then they had been in a lot of fight with, with uh, NGOs. And they were very reluctant uh, to, to have a, a stakeholder a dialogue because they feared that they would just be burned down. Uh, so so you, this is something we really noticed that, that this kind of history of controversy that you have around some technologies might really make it hard and really make it hard to make steps to have a more constructive uh, dialogue. So that was really, and I think another thing is for me was not so much between countries or technologies, but, but more between smaller and bigger companies. I think both have, have really opportunities and constraints for doing responsible innovation, but they're re- really different. So for a large company, if you get the, their dedication, often quite a bit of resources are available within the company. There, there are people working in the company who, who are willing to make an effort, but it really requires commitment on, uh, also uh, yeah, from a large number of people in, in the company, and it is done then in a very structured way. On the other hand, smaller companies, uh, yeah, they, and they don't have really resources to do an assessment or some, sometimes uh, also stakeholder dialogue. One of the smaller companies just saw this was much too much work for, for them because they're just small. Uh, but at the same time, they were also flexible or, or, and very open uh, to, to, to ideas. So it's interesting that that maybe the way they can do responsible innovation is also different. If you would formulate in terms of the the kind of responsibility dimensions that Stilco and 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 Owen use, hey, you have this uh, inclusiveness, anticipation, uh, reflexivity, uh, responsiveness. Then our impression was that that larger companies might be much more open to doing anticipation because they 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 and 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 they looking at the future or building scenarios often anyway, while the smaller companies act much more in responsiveness or could much more be responsive in the sense that they can act quickly on new questions or demands from society, but are not so much in the business of anticipation because they simply feel they don't have the resources to do so. So we felt both could do responsible innovation, but the ways they might do so might be different. That's one of the things that that we gathered from this. No, that's really interesting. So it seems like yeah, the large companies obviously have more resources and more people power, but with yeah. that comes more inertia for change a little bit, yeah. a bit harder yeah. to kind yeah. of implement these changes. Whereas the smaller yeah. companies, they have less resources, but with that comes the flexibility of yeah. Yeah. kind of yeah. maneuvering yeah. to yeah. take on. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So as part of the PRISM project, you and some collaborators uh, wrote up a report on the six rules for industry yeah. on taking on RRI. Yeah. Uh, how? What was that process what did that entail and how difficult was it well how difficult was it to kind of condense all these ideals down to six key points i suppose it's quite it must have been quite important to have them as quite condensed bite size so it yeah, wasn't just a yeah, whole yeah, report of yeah, recommendations yeah. yeah so what we 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 try to do so so maybe and and this relates to indeed your point about condensing so one thing that that we uh, i think it is interesting uh if you look a lot, a lot, a lot of more academic work on ROI is about very 
extensive frameworks about how we should do ROI, how we should govern innovation, and that makes all sense. That's not the way that industry usually <laughs> works, I think. They, they much more hands-on and much more... Uh, so, so this is actually, at least for me, one of the reasons that I felt it would be nice to have well, six, of course, it could be five or seven, I mean, six, <laughs> but a small number of relative simple rules of, of them uh, from how you can do responsible innovation in a way that, that, that uh, it, also in a language that is rather plain for companies, so to say, because this was some of the things that, that we, we, we encountered that they found a lot of, 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 the, of, of the talk about responsible innovation. They found it very <laughs> quickly, very uh, jargon-like and, 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 and vague. And, and what we try to do is to do, well, still do justice to the academic ideas behind the responsible innovation, but to put it in a language that companies could understand. And this is basically why we formulated these principles. So this was, yeah, quite a bit bit of work. And, and I also, I'm not sure whether these six principles covered everything, uh, but but I think they still, in a decent way, point to certain things that companies can do and, and, and then maybe should do uh, if they want to innovate more responsibly. So were these points taken from feedback from the pilot studies or were they come from like literature reviews by yourself or a combination of the two? I think they mainly came from, from the pilot studies, not in the sense that they were literally suggested by, by in the pilots, but more that we distilled these rules from our experiences in these pilots. But I think to a large extent, of course, they... I mean, some are about stakeholder engagement or about how to be more. So they're based in the end on, on, the, on the existing literature on responsible innovation. And we also try to formulate them. I already mentioned the four uh, still go uh, Owen principles uh, of in inclusion, uh, reflexivity, responsiveness. Uh, this one I'm forgetting. <laughs> oh, I was going to list them in the second. So <laughs> yeah. don't worry. I've got them all written down here if you want me okay. to cover them. Yeah. So, so, so. We try to make sure that that somehow we covered all these four dimensions in these recommendations. Uh, so what we try to do is to make sure that that. So in that sense, they were formulated with an eye to to the more general literature on responsible innovation, and they certainly try to do justice to the more general literature on, on innovation. But at the same time, they they were less, lessons about how we. So one of them is, for example, this idea that. So one of the things and and. And this has also been written in the literature, but you might say often companies companies use, usually don't do responsible innovation under that term because they don't know that term and and am I doing far less than you want from a responsible innovation, but they're doing some things that resemble uh, most would look into safety, would do safety assessments, many would do life cycle uh, uh, assessments, uh, look at sustainability. So one of our ideas and, and and i think this also we uh, resonated with the companies uh, was that a good starting point for responsible innovation might to just be to start with these initiatives that companies do anyway and, and try to broaden them so for example in a life cycle analysis uh, you can just do it by an expert but you can also include stakeholders uh, in it or you could include additional environmental concerns uh, into it or you could make sure because interestingly in one of the projects we, we, we looked at, they did a life cycle ana analysis, but they just did it after they had developed the product uh, and somehow it had no implications at all for the product they developed. Now, that of course, there's an opportunity to do the life cycle analysis maybe earlier and to have... So what we thought is in many cases, they're doing things which they themselves already find useful, uh, but we can maybe then uh, invite them to broaden up these processes so that it includes more what we, from an academic point of view, consider responsible innovation, so to say. <laughs> so. I suppose it's one of those things that RRI, it's it's kind of like a double-edged sword. It's some of the some of the principles seem fairly obvious, but of yeah. the, but also there's also quite a lot of jargon that comes with that. So I suppose yeah. it must be quite important to work with the companies to say you're actually doing quite a lot of stuff that involves in yeah. RRI and responsible in innovation so it's just it's not a totally new endeavor it's just developing yeah. what you're doing already I suppose yeah yeah and I and I think it can go both ways so, so 
indeed, sometimes it's telling them you're already doing a lot of stuff, but but you can add to things. Sometimes it's also that they're thinking they're doing things to be saying, well, so sometimes they think it is just listening to the clients. And I, I think it is more than that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's also listening to stakeholders and also being aware of, of both the social skills and, and moral issues. So sometimes it is also, of course, in, in, a, in a nice and constructive way, being a bit critical about what they're doing or they assuming that it is just listening to the to the customers because uh, but I think it is a little bit more than that. So sometimes it could also be be critical in a way about what they what they're doing. But of course, yeah, certainly in this side of you try to be do that in a constructive way. But but I think you I think there was a, certainly with the companies we worked with. I think partly why they asked us is because they saw they could learn something from us. So there was some room to be critical because they I think partly while well, they didn't hire us, but they let us be involved because they thought, well, maybe they have something to say we didn't think of. I mean. <laughs> so I'm just going to list out the six rules just for the listeners. Of, yeah. I'm going to make the paper available on, in the description of this podcast yeah, so yeah. if you want to no, learn a little bit more so. about yeah. them. But uh, yeah, so the six lessons are strategizing for stakeholder engagement, broadening current assessment, placing value center stage, experiment for responsiveness, monitoring RRI processes, and aim for shared values. So these sort of, these lessons seem to like integrate both bottom up and top down kind of approaches. Yeah. But I just wanted to ask, is it kind of a wholesale thing? Would you recommend that companies need to take on all six lessons or can it be a little bit more a la carte, like picking which ones fit them better? Or is it depending on what's already in place in the company, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I think it's maybe depending a bit. So I don't think it is a kind of, although I, I think there should be room for companies to make their own choices and, and, and to do something that is appropriate to their technology or their context or their market. Uh, at the same time, I, I don't think it is completely a la carte because it is not just pick uh, pick what you like and don't do what you don't like. I mean, <laughs> because I think in at least for me, in the end, responsible innovation comes from a certain normative idea. And, and for me, the core of that idea is that somehow you, you open up the innovation process to a wider range of stakeholders and a, a, wider, a wider range of concerns, uh, values, needs that exist in society. So I think at the very least, it, it, it needs to uh, result in, in, in really opening up the innovation process. And I think you have the same discussions with corporate social responsibility, CSR. Sometimes companies have big CSR policies and uh, long stories about what they're doing on the website, uh, but you still feel they do not really <laughs> take their responsibility seriously. And, and I'm not sure whether that's a matter uh, of, of, of just uh, having a list of things that you should do. It is also, it's also in part about an attitude, so to say, or part, in part about being really serious about your responsibility and willing to learn from society. And I think that for me, is the really important thing. And of course, these things are intended to help with that. But but uh, maybe even with our six lessons, a company could do it and not do it seriously, <laughs> if you understand what I mean. <laughs> I suppose always the danger with these sort of things. Yeah. You know, it becomes yeah, a box ticking exercise yeah, rather than you, a you culture don't want change. It, 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 to become a checklist and people just tick the boxes. And at the same time, you want to have something in place that, that, that gives them some clues about what you what is important but in the end uh, i think it is not just about ticking the boxes i think in the end it has a lot to do also with a kind of attitude and being willing to take seriously you, your responsibility as as a company i think it starts and, and, and ends with, with that <laughs> basically because you also talk about in this report about the importance of having internal and external kind yeah. of monitoring practices and i suppose that leads into kind of making sure that companies if they do take on like yeah. these initiatives yeah. that they are doing more than just the bare yeah. minimum perhaps. Yeah, and, and I think, and this is related to this, I think the internal and the external monitoring serve some different uh, ends. So I think the internal monitoring uh, could largely be part of a kind of uh, learning process within the company. Uh, so this is not necessarily so much about uh, accounting what you're doing or, or explaining what you're doing, but more just eager to, to improve what you're doing within the company. And this could even be best be internal monitoring, not so much explaining to the outside world, but just trying to learn internally. But I think the external is, I think 
responsible innovation requires at least some external accountability. It, it, it implies at least also some willingness to explain to the outside world and, and to being also to being checked on what you're doing. And I think there the external monitoring is important also to see that it is not just mere window dressing uh, of what the companies are doing. And I think these goals are a bit different. So, so I think the internal monitoring might be, it sounds strange, but maybe a, even a bit independent processes, so to say. The external monitoring is more about outsiders organization looking, uh, well, are they doing at least some things that you would expect them at least minimally to do and hopefully may have more, but at least minimally. And I think the internal monitoring is much more about improving yourself and, 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 and willingness uh, to, 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 uh, to learn. Yeah. So as part of the PRISM project, you developed a number of resources and tools that could help industries kind of take yeah. on these principles and incorporate res uh, responsible innovation and RRI into their practices. Yeah. How do you envisage that going in for future industries that are hoping to perhaps take these principles on board? Do you think it involves networking within these companies or within yourself? Or do you think there are kind of steps that could be taken for industries just to sort of integrate these practices themselves? Yeah, I think there are a number. So, so one of the things that we developed is, 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 is something like what we call a roadmap. And the idea of a roadmap is that a company could itself develop a kind of roadmap about how it uh, wants to implement responsible innovation in its own practices. Uh, but also if it is developing in technology in the different phases of the, of the development uh, where it could do different kinds of activities. So this was a kind of tool that they could help to, to plan more in a more strategic and, and organized way how, how they do responsible innovation. I personally think that, that, that the networking is also important. I'm also inclined to think that, that for some of these things that are important for responsible innovation, companies might want to rely on external expertise. Uh, mm -hmm. So, of course, we try to do a lot of things that companies can do themselves. But I also think that we should not underestimate just uh, raising certain issues within or awareness of certain issues. It might require some expertise in ethics or some expertise in, in humanities that might not be always be present in companies. So. Uh, and I personally think, if you think about more about the ecosystem, that there would be room for more consultancy services for ethical issues or, or for responsible innovation uh, that help companies in a sincere way to do this. So I think this is also important. And then the other thing that is, I think, important, certainly in certain sectors, is that for some companies, it might be very hard to do things on their own. And and and. Basically, the two types of reasons for that. One type of reason is, is competition. So sometimes it is just more costlier to do more responsible innovation. And then it might help if you agree with companies in a sector, we all want to do a minimal thing and you work together. But the other thing is also what you notice is, like I already said, small companies, they often cannot afford so much extra activities. But they felt that maybe on, on the level of, an, uh, of a sector or a technical branch, uh, they might be able to do more. So I think this was also something that we learned more in terms of, say, the ecosystem, that some of these might be, and we actually didn't anticipate that because we really looked at individual companies. Uh, but I think uh, some of these might be more collaborative efforts, maybe more usefully. Uh, so if we perhaps if we would do the product again, we would maybe more look at also sectoral organizations and approach these and, and see whether we could organize this more as collaborative processes among uh, companies in the same sector, who also have, an, to some extent, a common interest in, in being being seen as being responsible. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had it in um, in the in the chemical industry. You had the initiative of responsible care, which already started in the 1970s and 1980s. And what's interesting is it's a kind of response to public doubts about uh, and, and and worries about dangerous chemicals, uh, environmental uh, damage. Uh, and at some point, the chemical companies realized that it was not just a matter of they individually behaving responsible, but maybe also the whole sector behaving responsible. And this responsible care initiative was something in a way to say, uh, increase the level playing field in terms of responsibility. And, and I think that type of strategies, that's one of the things I personally learned might be quite important because it makes it easier for companies to, to, to take the step. 
and also more attractive to, to take the step. So I think this kind of collaborative uh, things are also really uh, uh, important, apart from what individual companies uh, uh, can do. So kind of my final question is, because uh, you, talk, uh, you talked a little bit just then about collaborations and how yeah. important that is. It's maybe a slightly dirty topic, but the idea that research institutes and universities, they are industries, they are companies by themselves. Do you think they should be perhaps taking more of a leaf from kind of quote unquote, like actual companies that uh, should they be working more together within these spheres? Or can they, is there a synergy that they could be learning from each other within kind of the whole RRI kind of ecosystem? Or I don't know, is there something that industries yeah. could learn from research institutes? Because they're, they're similar, but different. There's definitely a lap over with the Venn diagram, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that's, that's a kind of uh, interesting question. I think they can learn from each other's both ways, I think. Uh, uh, universities can also be quite competitive vis-a-vis mm -hmm. <laughs> -vis each other and I can maybe also and that, but then the other thing at least maybe I've been still a bit idealistic idea of universities but I, I mean the way I look at universities is, is, is that of course they aimed at research but they also aimed at the common good mm -hmm. and, and uh, I also think that companies can contribute to the common good but I think in the system we have they more supposed to work for, for their own interest <laughs> and to pay attention also to the common, I mean, of course, the whole of uh, CSR and, and these kind of things that they also contribute. But at least to my mind, working for the common good is much more part of the mission of, of, of the university. But I think what's interesting, if you look at certain, certainly certain very uh, innovative or emerging technologies in, 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 for example, nano or biotechnology, you often have uh, the networks often exist of both companies and, 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 and universities. Uh, and that I would say, I mean, this also, in my view, at least, responsibility of the universities, all the technical universities involved in this, it, it, is, is to really keep this common good more high on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And I think we can expect a little bit more from them than from, from companies. Which I don't mean to say that companies are necessarily only for self-interest, or, 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 but, I, but, but I believe that in that sense, I think, their role is also a bit different in, in an overall division of labor, so to say. Uh, at least, maybe I'm idealistic, but that's the way I, I, I look at it. It's also why, but in the end, I believe, certainly if you talk about responsible innovation in these innovative, innovative technologies, so you need both the, comp the companies and the universities to take responsible innovation really serious and really as something that, that, that should be high on, on our mind. Uh, yeah. I suppose the ethical, your ethical background is showing a little bit. <laughs> I'm an ethicist, I can't help. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, you're welcome. I enjoyed it. The Respios project is funded by the EU with the grant number 872146. To learn more about the Respios project and the other pillars of RRI, please go to respios.eu. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.